If you're looking for the father of the craft beer revival in Ireland, well then we've got your man. This is the Architects of Business, Joe's weekly series of interviews with leading entrepreneurs in partnership with EY Entrepreneur of the Year. I'm Ty Genwright and today I'll be speaking with Liam Lahart, who put a new spin on the pint of plain at the Porterhouse Brewing Company. Liam, thanks very much for, uh, for talking to us. It strikes me you were doing this whole craft beer thing before it really got cool. Is that right? Um, yes, that would be true. Uh, it depends on how far back I go. Um, I suppose um, the f- we first came across, um, which were described in Ireland, these funny beers, uh, in when I was living in London and uh, my cousin and, and uh, recently departed, Oliver, um, he was in college in St Albans. And um, this was in, I'm going back to 79, 80, uh, that long ago, when uh, the campaign for real ale had started up in London or in England. And um, there was a guy, David Bruce, who had um, the Firkin pubs. And um, we used to, on a Saturday afternoon, Oliver would come in from St Albans. we toddle on down to the maybe the Camden Market, um, do a bit of shopping for bootleg records and uh, adjourned to one of the Firkin pubs to have a, a pint of Dog Bolter, which was um, 7% ale. And we'd be talking about, imagine a beer 7%, and we had we had three pints of it. Whereas in, in these days now, sure, these the the bearded folk sipping the Lagunitas and the... Uh, the hipster crew. The, the hipster crew, are, so they're only saying only 7%. <laughs> they want more. They want more, yeah. So what was it drew you into those pubs? Um, I suppose I had I escaped Tipperary, and um, I went to London. Uh, I, I I put my toe in the water in college. Didn't last too long, and um, ended up in 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 Kilburn in London, uh, and um, I was working for uh, actually I was repairing or working on. TV games. The first of the worked for Video Master, um, repairing TV games. That what you plug into your TV and play table tennis and right. basketball the and chess. Commodore sixty four and stuff like that, or was it before that even? It was slightly before that, yeah. Right. Yeah. And Oliver was in uh, university in Saint Albans studying law, so uh, we were first cousins, and um, um, I say me new to London. Oliver had all these ideas of. Of, of I got in. He was actually working in a in a brewery in near St Albans, and brewing uh, real ale then. So that was the revival for campaign for real ale. So when he came into London, then had to check out the bars down there, which we spend many a Saturday afternoon doing that research, of course. So craft beers were all naturally research, yeah. But I suppose uh, you, you didn't realise it was going to turn into to what it did. Well, craft beer wasn't even. A word that was used then in those days it was it was real ale and then just to fast forward a bit when um we actually opened the i did some traveling for a while all our physics studies and in, we moved to dublin in um i suppose 82 83 and opened the brewery in blessington hearty's brewery brewing a real ale at the time dempsey's had just opened in dublin and just as, as it happened, the two of us happened to be around the same time. Real ale, you know, was never, it's has long gone since from Dublin, as opposed to there was always, it was always hanging around England. But so we then, when real ale was working, kind of working, we, we, we then produced a keg ale, a larder and an ale. So that was really the first of what you, what would be now called craft beer. So were you kind of, you know, caught between two different renaissances? As you say, there was the whole campaign for real ale in England, which seems to be where you got your inspiration from. But then the whole craft beer thing was a bit more hipster, the whole brew pub thing, kind of coming over maybe more so from the US. Yeah. Now, and I have to say that it, both myself and Oliver never were never really the card carrying real ale campaign for real ale guys who wouldn't accept anything else they were so purists I mean I remember once 
stage at uh, we were at a beer festival a, cam- a real ale beer festival in London actually there's a camera one in um, in West London and whereas we had a stout which is just nitrogenated not filtered um, very handcrafted beer oh and they were poo pooing it oh my god that's nitrogen the gas has touched that beer and you know they were just so purist that kind of got a little bit fed up of the, although I still enjoy uh, real ale and I admire what they've done but they were a bit purist about it but as you say when the um, and IPA was actually one of our favourite styles of beer which was never heard of really here in Ireland and uh, IPA being an India Pale Ale which is a, a beer that's in in actually in Covent in, in London really where they Covent Garden where it was first started um, where, where the beers were sent when the troops were fighting in India and they had to put hops into it to keep them fresh travelling across the world but when the Americans got their hands on real ale or on IPA uh, they brought uh, India Pale Ale to a different level with the level of hops they have in there which is so the you know an IPA English style and an IPA American style are very different so when you were heading into those pubs in Kilburn back in the day with uh, with Oliver and and seeing their kind of whimsical brand names and their their cheeky marketing were you thinking I can make this work in Ireland now I have to remind you Kilburn there weren't those funky bars in Kilburn. Kilburn was a pretty tough Irish area where I happened to be living. Right. We used to be heading down to Camden, um, pro- well, across the Camden, which is fairly close, or, or down into the city um, where they had some, some of these beers. Yes, and to answer your question, yes, the, the bars were even, like that's 30 years ago, um, they were quite, uh, quirky bars, benches, and sawdust on the floor. Yeah, there were, um, you know, and, and they put certainly put ideas into our head. And what were I mean? What were those ideas that you know? This is the answer to all our dreams. And well, I suppose the, the f- when we eventually got together and bought a bar, our first bar was in Bray, and uh, that was in eighty nine. Um, when and at the time I had been um, just before that I was assistant manager in Davy Burns which was white shirt bow tie um, before that I had been in um, O'Donoghue's in Marion Row which was a bit of a quirky bar sawdust on the floor and so when we opened the bar in Bray um, which was the wave crest at the time when we turned it into the, the, the first porterhouse it was polo shorts jeans um loud music and a lot of different types of beers how did you how did you kind of come up with the format and the location why Bray because Bray because that's all we could afford (laughs) Uh, that's the cheapest pub you could buy um, with potential right (laughs) so yeah and but uh, also uh, I sold my house in Terenure which I, I I was just married had um, just her first son was born and um, the it was an old hotel in Bray so sold my house uh, put that into the business and I moved over head of, o- over the over the bar so I made a little apartment upstairs which was fantastic and we needed to do well actually when we bought the bar it was red velvet seating with carpets to match and uh, Farmaca counter. And in the first year, this is 89, 90, we lost 50,000. Yeah, about a grand a week we were losing. Um, and I was saying, hmm, didn't tell my wife this. Um, this is not good. And trying to ponder a way out of it, Oliver said, oh, we need to borrow more money, spend it, and, and make the place where, you know, make the place an interesting place to come to. I said, who's going to loan us money when we're losing a grand a week? But we actually, uh, what we did was, we actually had managed to get a turnover up uh, by putting in bands. Um, but we were 
we didn't have the formula right. We're probably paying too much for the bands and we, we weren't getting the turnover and up. We weren't getting money on the door. Was there something wrong with the, the kind of the format you put on in that pub at the beginning or was it that the audience wasn't quite convinced of it yet? Yeah, there weren't. Well, first of all, the bar, for the customer we're looking for, red velvet seat and carpet and for market counter wasn't really what they were looking for. So we we eventually persuaded the bank by not showing them the accounts, but just showing them our figures that they should loan us um, a couple of hundred K. We put it into the, uh, we, and with the bars as it is today, island bar, um, stone floor, um, wooden seats, and a great sound system. Sound system has changed, but not an awful lot else. Okay. And and that we were there, the cool kids there with the polo shirts and jeans. But not, it wasn't just your clothes. It was the beers, wasn't it? I mean, did you have well, kind of the established brands on tap in that pub? We did because... You know, there was nothing else. You're a bit younger than me here. Um, this is Never. 1990. I can't even count back that far. <laughs> um, where there was only Heineken, Carlsberg, Budweiser, Smithwick's, a little bit of that, and Guinness. But we couldn't get access to different beers. So... Uh, Oliver came up with an idea that um, if um, when you go on your holidays, bring us back a bottle of beer that uh, we don't have and we'll give you two pints for it. And I said, Jeez, do we have to give two pints? Can we not just give one? No, no, we'll give two pints. So that became, uh, and you know, and when you when you look back at it, um, telling Oliver that was a fantastic idea, was that it got people interested in different beers. It also meant when, you know, They've brought this bottle of beer home, so they're going out at night. Oh, we better drop down to the porterhouse and we get her a couple of free beers on this, you know, because and, and and we held on to them by because we had music going, the beers were good, and um, the atmosphere was great. That's a huge leap, though, really, isn't it? I mean, you opened the place in Bray because that's where you could afford, and then what was it? Uh, six or seven years later, yeah, you go into Temple Bar, and that's prime city centre property. I mean, that must have been a huge financial leap, was it? Well, and it was a formula that we continued. Basically, we got we got the bar in Bray at a reasonable price. We upped the turnover. Um, the bank were happy with us in that they were more into loan loan to value then, um, so that the property went up in value because the turnover went up. And we were lowly low leveraged, so they loaned us more money to put a deposit on. Um, now, and bearing in mind, as I'm reminding you, that it was Parliament Street, which was not a very good street. So, when you look around and see all these other uh, craft beer bars and craft breweries, do you, do you kind of feel validated that yeah, I was right? That's this is what people want. Well, yes. Um, do you feel proud of it? I do yes. It's in, but in ways, it's made our life harder in that we were maybe little oasis in the middle of a desert uh, and um, people were coming to seek us out. <laughs> now everybody's at it and in some ways um, we have to reinvent ourselves that we're um, we're not the old boys that we're still um, making new um, different beers as well. So much has changed over the last 30 years or so. Um, but just remind me, what was it like when you were starting up and trying to muscle your way into into pubs? I mean, were you were you bullied at any point by the big players? Well, yes. I in in when we had Hearty's Brewery and uh, in that was in the mid eighties, and you know when you think about how silly the the the, the bigger breweries were, um, they would be cutting our lines, the our beer lines, they'd be telling a bar owner, listen, I'll give you two free kegs there. Just get rid of those guys. And a lot of bar owners would take us in just to be kicked out again, to get a couple of free kegs for the bigger brewery. Are you serious? They were just kind of baiting you. Yeah. And this was just before um, your um, Spirnoff Ice, Bacardi Breezers, various sweet and ciders were, were, were coming in because the beer industry had got so boring. And whereas, and I'm sure they're looking back now, they should have let guys like 
you know, Harty's Brewery, Dempsey's Brewery, they should have let us keep the thing interesting by having our beers on the counter. We were never going to be a threat um, of uh, because there was only so much we could produce. We sh- we sh- they should have let us go and make it interesting rather than um, people were got fed up of going to the bars. And then that's where, as I said, your Alka Pops came in and which were, you know, lasted a while. But the, and the beer guys lost their um, lost their keggage because it had got boring. But they just could not see that. It was very short sighted of them. But remind me of, you know, 30 years in the pub trade, antisocial hours. I mean, do you work until closing time much still or well, did you back then? Well, I, I did up to. Well, up to uh, before Oliver passed away, I was pretty much very much hands on in, in, in the bars. Um, and, you know, because we said we had opened two bars in New York, so I went over, you know, uh, over there a lot. But certainly, yes, and I'd be in Temple Bar, I'd be in Nassau Street, I'd be in Bray three late nights a week. Um, tough going. And especially, um, you know, when the kids were young, the way it used to work was that, you know, you'd, get, you'd set up in the morning, you'd, do, you'd cover lunch, and by 2.30 you're getting out of there collecting the kids from school, and you take the afternoon off. And you certainly try and take one or two days a week off as well. But it was really tough going. And the late nights, and I, I thought, you know, I've done late nights probably for 30 years. And in the last year, year and a half, where I'm now pretty much stuck in the office. Uh, total change of lifestyle. Alarm clock set for twenty past seven. You know, in in the office before nine. Um, you know, by eleven thirty. You know, time for me to hit the bed because you know I'm tired. You know, ten years ago I was only. Um, I'd often have a get home in the afternoon, evening, hit the bed for an hour, up and out again. Uh, but you know something. Uh, I probably find I have a lot more energy now. I feel a lot better. And, and this is only a year and a half doing what normal people do. Obviously, the business was started by yourself and, and Oliver. I mean, are you, are you still talking about Oliver when you refer to to we and us there? Yeah, I suppose. Um, as a matter of fact, I, I would always, um, when I hear guys saying I, uh, I said, what's this I? But this is we. It's like we are a family. I mean, the porterhouse the whether it's Dingle, the distillery, the bar, the brewery, uh, we have the the restaurants as well. The you know myself and Oliver, were cousins. His his uh, his son now Ellie, Elliot and 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 Holly work with it. Uh, Elliot's my godson. Um, I have two sons who you know they. Some are in college, but they're in and out of the business. But it is a family business. And my business partners in, in the various bars I've worked with for years and consider them family. We, uh, when there's family events, we all meet up. Um, yes, and it's all about we. Is it important that it was a family business? Would it have survived in the same way or succeeded in the same way otherwise? Um, well, that's probably a good question. And in general, I would say yes, it would. But no, 2011, 12 were difficult times. Um, when the bottom fell out of the market, um, being a bit over borrowed, um, the customer base gone. Uh, when you're under a lot of pressure, it really helps that it's family and our people that you have worked with for a long time and trust that, um, you know, when the shit hit the fan, as it did in those days, you needed good guys around you, because um, and you know it's it's when things are not good and business is not good and you're trying to pay the wages and you're trying to meet the bank commitments, you do need to have um, family and friends around you, because it's a uh, it gets tough out there. They were horrible years, um, and um, thankfully we're through those. Oliver was your cousin, but it, it sounds like you had a bit more of a, a closer relationship than most cousins. It sounds like you were more brotherly. Well, almost. yeah. Uh, well, he was, yes. Uh, we were like, well, we fought like brothers anyway. Um, yeah, we'd been in, in business together for a, a long, long time. Um, 
even when Oliver grew up in um, most part in, in, in England but his dad was a judge in the colonial service but from the age of four, five, six he used to come down to uh, a famous place I'm from Gortnehu uh, myself and Shane Long are the uh, two famous people from Gortnehu <laughs> um, uh, so um, Oliver used to come down with on the farm then and then we used to stay with our aunties in, in Drumcondra as well so we used to spend all our summers together from the age of four or five yeah then then as I said got into business together Were you as close back then as you ended up being? Yeah yeah we we're, we're the same age um, I think Oliver was two months younger than me um, but yeah we were very well very close uh, as in friends and uh, and brothers but totally different in um, in way of doing things um, as uh, all of you to say he'll get he'll provide the right environment to get the customers in and and I'll serve them and make sure I take the money from them and it goes into the till um I, you know even when Oliver was still working as a barrister and he'd be come out to bray on 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 the um, you know, on a Saturday and Sunday and for the first 20 minutes pointing out everything that's wrong with the place that bulb is gone that um uh, you know why don't you take the tea towel down off that bottle of vodka there and because um, I was doing things in uh, well I would be doing practical things that um, a barman the publican would do and he would say look at things totally from a customer's viewpoint Was he more the showman? Oh most definitely a showman uh, always the showman yes he was because um, uh, uh, one of the things he was very proud of uh, you know, I trained as a barrister, but really not. Uh, I don't think he ever. He, his dad was a judge, but he never had his heart in it. Barristers are showmen. It strikes well, me well, it's actually yes, quite a good mix. Well, you're quite correct, but and that did his. I mean, he was well able to talk, and that that did help. Uh, but one of his first claim to fame was when we um, when we opened the bar in, in in Temple Bar, the brew pub, and we had we named two of the beers, Wiser Buddy. And probably, which were um, um, the logos on them were uh, quite close to Budweiser and Carl's. Never, I don't yeah. believe you. <laughs> and so, uh, within a couple of weeks, the letter came in to stop what we were doing. So, and to take away all the the various the labels we had. We had uh, the whole place. Well, of the two of their eight beers. There was a lot of uh, beer mats and that would uh, related to Wiser Buddy and probably. So he said, we, we need a couple of weeks to get um, to get her our, all the various displays down and we need to change the names of the beer. So they gave us a couple of weeks and then um, Oliver said, listen, we'll run. We need how are we going to get the names in this? So we ran uh, um, a radio advertising about to change the names of the beers formerly known as Wiser Buddy and Probably. And this was an ad that went on for uh, about 10 days. Uh, we got a second letter f uh, from our solicitors then. But um, that raised so much publicity. We, we got on the Wall Street Journal and I think it was the New York Times. Uh, actually, we have a nice little story on that in, in both the Porterhouse and Temple Bar and in, in Nassau Street about the beer formerly known as Wiser Buddy because we were 21 years last year and Elliot um, put up this big poster that's um, you can't miss. So go in and have a read of it. It's a great story. Yeah, absolutely. We certainly will. I mean, was that kind of uh, mischievous, mischievous streak? Was that um, more him or was it his idea? I mean... It, oh, yes. Yeah, sure. I would have been... Um, so, you know, Scared by the solicitor's I, letter. I, I used to be scared about solicitor's letters. As you get older, um, uh, you you learn to how to deal with them a bit more. But uh, that that no, that was that was really interesting, um, great time. And he used to love telling that story. But um, it, we we still have a um, we did a campaign some years ago about saying we have no mar marketing budget. Uh, tell everybody about us. You know, we we playing Porter won um, a gold medal, and so uh, he claimed. No, no, we did win a gold medal, <laughs> and it was a very prestigious one. But the our, our strip line to it was um, 
as I said, we have no marketing budget to tell everybody. Well, the be best publicity is free, isn't it? It's kind of like the Ryanair model. Yeah, yes. So, uh, yeah, Oliver was your man for that, yeah. So, I mean, he died suddenly. Mm -hmm. What was it like when you when you heard? Uh, yeah, I probably don't want to go into that. That's still too emotional. Okay. Yeah. Well, what impact did it have on the running of the business then? Well, um, the one day in the last few years, um, when you know, if we go on to say Dingle Distillery, strictly speaking, Dingle Distillery sh sh was not possible to happen because it was two thousand and twelve. There was no money about. There was no bank funding. Everybody was telling Oliver this couldn't happen. Most definitely me. Uh, bearing in mind, um, you make a whiskey and it takes a minimum three years uh, to sell it. Um, that's um, that's tough in the cash flow. So um, there, but he wouldn't let go. He was like. Talk about a dog with a bone. He just kept on and on. He drove us all around the bend. Accountant said, you know, you're going to break the company. Um, it's so everything was pulled into to Dingle. But it was in some ways done on a shoestring, um, although we did spend quite a lot of money on it. We always assumed in a way that um, it would have to be um, at some stage to get to to get the most out of it, we'd have to take on a a, a partner with deep pockets. But um, then, lo and behold, uh, we, we we decided to make a, a gin and vodka just for ourselves. In the um, we would sell them through the bars just for a bit of cash flow. Uh, but then gin became uh, everybody was into gin. So gin now became the new thing. Now in a way, we're nearly a gin distillery um, making whiskey. But the, the change, so Oliver in the last few years had been putting a huge amount of effort into into the distillery. And I, you know, the bars and restaurants were taking along okay. The brewery was quite small. But, um, yeah, but the, certainly the, 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 what's changed really is there's a, a lot of the fun has gone out of it. As in, you know, uh, you know every, most evenings I'd, you, you know, if I'd pop in, I'd know it's, when he's finished work at six or seven in the evening, he'd be he'd be having a beer or two before he he'd head home. He'd always have a, a group of guys around him because lots of people wanted to come in and, and have a chat with him. And uh, so that end of it has been less fun. And we don't have this. Um, we we don't seem to be getting the same publicity as uh, as we used to. So we have to work a lot harder on that. So are you finding you're kind of have kind of? Do you find you have to almost act a bit more like Oliver used to? Act up as more of the showman. Well, uh, when you know, at various events where I'm asked to speak, I'm you know I always say, listen, um, you know I'm my own man. Like you know I, I got to where I am now. I'm not Oliver, and I could never. There's no point in me trying to be. You know Oliver was a showman. He was a, a great speaker. He didn't need any notes. He just um, spoke off the cuff. Um, there's no point in me trying to be that. Um, now I'm um, his son Elliot is shaping up well though, a uh, bit of a chip off the old block, and um, so we'll be rolling him out now, and that's what the, the media want to see is a, is a young guy like him, uh, and I'll direct operations in the background. So I keep keep all the guys going. We have a we have you know we we have a few partners in a lot of the businesses, um, and we have a lot of staff. Um, if I can keep all the guys going and um, keep the peace and chair the meetings, you know, we're doing OK. You talked about the really bad days of 2011, 2012. People had emigrated. The pub trade just wasn't what it was. How do you think it's recovered now? Um, when, and I mean, I was very much involved in, 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 in those days. In, in, I was hands on. Um, and and when just to go back on that, one of the things we did in say Porterhouse in in in, in Temple Bar, where we were dependent a lot on on um, on tourists, and they had just stopped coming, or they stopped coming in numbers, 
or especially the good spenders from the UK stopped coming. Um, and I was I was upstairs in um, one of the upper floors one day and I saw a few people sitting around and a few Europeans, guys and girls sitting on a table for four, taking up tables and I said, mm, there's something wrong here. So I got a plan. We we're going to, so from, uh, we normally only have the ground floor open during the day, um, especially in those days when there was no customers. Uh, we didn't need the upper floors. So I said, right, we'll reserve all the tables on the upper floor. So we will um, effectively run the the upper floors as a restaurant. So uh, if you want a table to eat, it's a table for two. Yes, we get to table two, table for four. Uh, no, we don't want to eat. Well, uh, you can use the tables at the bar. And we brought our food business from, you know, um, we might have been doing about, I don't know, 12, 14K a week in, in, in food there. We added 50% to it within within a year. Whereas, and we brought the gap closer to where we were, didn't get there, and food being less of a margin, but um, we got our food trade really working well. And now that we have the tourists back again, and there is um, more business around, and the hotels are full, um, we have the that's a fantastic model we have going down in, in, in Temple Bar. Great ground floor and a restaurant area of between five and nine. Works great. There's a lot of bars that are basically just restaurants these days, aren't there? I mean, is that a good or bad thing for the for the trade, or is it just a necessary evolution? I suppose it's a necessary evolution. Yeah, and that, and I'm sure a lot of people did what I did as well because we had to do something because the drinkers weren't there. Everybody, you know, at, you know, you remember you you were going to uh, Little and Tesco's to buy your slab of. Of, of beer drinking at home so you know people weren't spending money on on on, on drink um or they were coming out for special occasions but your early mid you know midweek was so you you had to do some but there was people around and they needed to eat you know you're poised now to open this you've already got the the distillery down in in dingle you've got a, a brewery project going on in in north dublin is that right yeah we are our, our you know, we we moved. Um, we had the, the brew pub in in Temple Bar. When we opened our, our bar in London, we, we, it just wasn't big enough. So we moved, what temporarily to a, a site in Ballycoolan in in um, out past Blanchestown, and we were there fifteen years. So yes, we've we've we have a brand new site now in uh, Glasnevin. Uh, by Broombridge uh, Lewis Line, as a matter of fact, um, it's a fantastic premises. Um, it's um, you know we, our brewer is delighted. Whereas we we up to that we had been in a very functional brewery, which was a pretty much a warehouse. But this is a proper brewery with drains, sloping floors, um, extraction. Um, it's um, very proud of it. We've it, we've just got in there in January. We're just about finding our feet and um, we'll be making a little bit of noise about it fairly soon. And uh, we're going to have a visitor center there um, and we'll be we will be producing a lot of interesting beers as well as our Main Street beers. So why is that a focus, you know, creating this visitor center as opposed to just opening up more pubs? I mean, some people might have thought there'd be a porterhouse in every town and city in the country by now. Yeah, and um, it was always our ambition to, when we had to move out of Temple Bar with a brew pub, and when we moved to Ballycoolan, the whole that was a temporary setup. We wanted to have a brewery in the city, and when, in the good times, property was too expensive. In the downturn, we couldn't uh, raise the money, uh, but we eventually got a site. Um, which is in in uh, Talca Valley uh, area, and we got the site, 
and then the Lewis line decided to come out there. So we said, listen, this is going, this is good. So we're in 20 minutes, 15 minutes of city centre, five minutes walk to the brewery. So what we didn't get in the city centre, we were going to bring the city centre to um, uh, to our brewery. And well, yeah, the, the, the idea being is that um, Dublin being a tourist city and also um, we want to get companies to have their Friday evening events, whether it's pizza, burgers, and beers in the brewery while listening to uh, to to a band, and you know it's by we want to um, bring the you know the the Dublin public, the tourists to us to see what we're doing. It's a craft beer industry, and that. Um, you know we are doing interesting things and it's 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 a showcase you were talking earlier about the difficulty in getting funding you've always seemed to have a fairly innovative approach to funding though haven't you i mean you were crowdsourcing for for the dingle distillery and i mean that's a great way of kind of drumming well, up a cap- captive audience as well as getting yeah, funding that, isn't well, it well that was um uh, you know so oliver came up with the founding fathers where pretty much selling a cask of whiskey in advance for, you know, six six grand. And, and, he, and he was having a go at me, Liam, how many casks have you sold? I said, Oliver, I'm finding it difficult getting a fiver for a pint and making sure uh, he pays for it that I don't have to on the street after it. And you're asking me, to, and, and he's getting it straight away, and you're asking me to get six grand for a cask that he won't, he won't see for three years. He said, watch me do it. So he did it. Um, and uh, and it was amazing. Any time he got, uh, you know, we we got a, an article on the paper, there'd be a big surge of people looking for it. But you know, it, it took a while, um, and it was it was a big sell. But in a way, and, and it's possibly, yeah, you know, I did manage to sell a few casks. But in comparison to uh, Oliver, he was um, he spoke with such passion, and he was, and he had to believe in something. He 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 wasn't a he wasn't a spoofer. He might exaggerate a bit, but he um, he couldn't get behind something if he didn't believe in it. You kind of you could see it in his face. So he um, you know he he was believable because he was telling the truth, and he was passionate and he knew it was going to work. But yes, and that obviously without raising, we sold five hundred casks, spent all the money. Uh, and uh, five years are up now, so um, the chickens are coming home to roost. There'd be other ways of raising money, though, wouldn't there? I mean, if, if somebody came along to you tomorrow with a, a cheque for a few million euro and said, listen, use this money, open a, a fleet of new pubs, would that be a compelling proposition? Well, we certainly have looked at the idea of franchise. And we have nearly done... Uh, nothing has... We haven't uh, completed the deal yet, but we're certainly looking at doing uh, one or two franchises where, but, you know, when you speak about franchises in general, you know, whether you have a subway bar or whether you have a a burger bar, they're, I'm not saying, you know, there there can be a small, you can get an easy entry in there, you know, get the the right side. I'm not saying it's easy, but being, I suppose, a publican that, do tend to be very individual thinking people. And if you manage to get a bar going, do you want um, me coming in saying that, you know, your picture is hanging the wrong way? Uh, Although people are coming around to that idea, I imagine within the next five years, we should, I think we'll have two or three franchise bars out there. Maybe not in this country, but it's certainly something we're looking at. Well, talking of checks for millions of euro, if one of them big players came along to you and offered you uh, perhaps a six-figure sum or even more, uh, seven figures, I think we'd be talking about a rate, <laughs> would you sell up? Uh, no. No. Uh, no, not now. Um, especially when... Um, Probably wouldn't have anyway, but Elliot is really big into the business. Uh, I think 
one or two. I have I have two sons and a daughter. Keen, who's in New York. Rory is back in Dublin now, and my daughter Jenny, who has just finished college. Um, I think one or two of them want to go into the business. Um, you know, would would we take on a strategic partner? Mm, depends, maybe. Especially, you know, if you're talking about, I have no, you know, I'd never sell the Porterhouse in Parliament Street. I'd never sell Porterhouse Central. They, they're just, um, you know, Porterhouse Covent Garden. They've been around for, for so long. I just, they're great bars. Um, why would I, you know? Um, the, it, would I take on a strategic partner in the brewery? Um, and as I said earlier, you get if you got somebody with lots of distribution, that certainly would help. But then you lose your independence, and we are very proud of being a family independent brewery. So I don't really see that changing soon. Do you feel like you owe it all over in some way to to keep it in the family? Well, I certainly had thoughts about um, when um, you know. When, it, when 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 he passed away, you know, a year and a half ago, we didn't have the brewery started, and at the time, you know, you, you, depending where you're looking from, there is an awful lot of breweries out there. Does Dublin, Ireland, need another brewery? And that certainly was. Mm, I could really have said, you know, something. You know, I think we'll just put a hold on that. I will put a stop on this. But I said, you know, something. You know, what would Oliver have wanted? I said, ah, oh, to hell, we'll, we'll, go, we'll go along with it. So, um, yeah, yeah, that would be kind of, that would be for him, all right, yeah. So you are kind of channeling his, his risk-taking energy? Oh, yes, the, 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 I, I always had um, Oliver to blame when, um, when we spent too much money, when we um, forgot to mention it to the bank that we bought this place and please, can we have the money now? Uh, yeah, Oliver always got to blame. Yeah, and I just did something recently and just, uh, you know, I couldn't blame Oliver on it. And uh, it was tough on the cash flow. But yeah, do you know, some of these things, and I was, I'm the conservative guy. Um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, the older I get, I'm still taking risks. Well, how much longer do you think you're going to keep turning up every day and putting your hand on the, on the books and on the pumps? Yeah, well, I suppose I'm, and I, I really miss the late night business and I'm, and I'm, um, not saying that I would like to go back to be doing, to having to be there at two o'clock in the morning. I miss not being there, and I'm because I'm up at whatever quarter seven, half seven in the morning. I really can't be there. I hope to do less hours in the office, and to be able to pop in now and again by surprise, um, and just to see how things are are ticking along, and because uh, I think I know the business pretty well. Um, and I suppose I want to take the stress out of life. Um, and that there has been a lot of stress. Um, the new brewery has been, um, has been, uh, you know, a lot of stress. Second bar in New York has been a lot of stress because it was kind of pretty much all down to me. And, but I've, those two things are done now. The distillery is, is going very well. Brewery, I have the right guys in place. We have export manager, we have national sales manager. Have uh, good partners there, and um, the younger guys are coming up. So um, yeah, I think that the the future is um, should be a little bit more golf, should be more holidays, and um, yeah. But I'll I'll be still hanging around for a while. So do you feel like you've left a real stamp or a mark on the Irish pub trade? Yeah, I suppose. Uh, yeah, I suppose we we certainly did. Uh, I, I have a lot of, um, you know, up to, you know, if up to six or seven years ago, if you asked me what it was, I would have said the publican. I probably, I'm, I'm probably more brewery, distillery, publican now. Um, so I have a lot of friends in, 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 in with bars around town. Uh, play golf with them every Thursday in uh, the LVA Golf Society, which is really good. Yeah, so yeah, when we're having a uh, yeah, yes, I suppose people would tell me that, and um, yeah, I, I like hearing it as well. So yes, yeah, we're we're proud of what we did. Okay.
Liam Lahart, thank you very much for talking to us. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. That's it for the Architects of Business for this week. Thanks very much for joining us. Thanks to our guest, Liam Lahart, our producer, Patrick Cohey, and all of the team here at Joe. The programme is made in partnership with EY Entrepreneur of the Year. Go to their website, eoy.ie, to learn more about the finalists for this year. And don't miss out on future or past editions of this programme by subscribing for free on iTunes, on your favourite Android podcast app, or you can watch The Architects of Business on YouTube. Check out some of Joe's other podcasts too, including The Hard Yards on Rugby, The GAA Hour, and our movie show, The Big Review Ski. I'm Ty Genwright. Thank you very much for being with us today, and we hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.